You're listening to the Sensuality Project Podcast, where the messiness of real life gets sexy, hosted by Stacey Herrera. This podcast is intended for mature audiences only. Episodes contain profane language and topics of a sexual nature that may not be suitable for children. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to another episode of the Sensuality Project Podcast. I am your host, Stacey Herrera. And I've been absent. I hope that you noticed. (laughs) I hope that you noticed that I was gone because if you've been tuning in regularly, you would have noticed that I hadn't posted a new episode, right? So life has been happening. Life has been happening. But here I am once again and back on track with bringing you the juiciest conversations on the internet. I am declaring that, okay? (laughs) You know, it's funny. You see those those things like, you know, the the best chicken in the world. And it's kind of like, how did you decide that? Anyway, so I'm declaring this podcast has the juiciest conversations on the internet. I said it, so that means it's true. (laughs) This week, this week, I am actually chatting with one of my favorite sister friends, Jen Pavich. And Jen and I actually recorded an episode months ago, back when back when hurricanes were like ravaging the U.S. And um, Jen is from Texas. And so when we recorded the episode, and it was so good, like there was so much great content in what we, in our conversation. But when I did the playback, the sound quality was really, really terrible. And I tried and tried and tried. I tried to edit the shit out of that audio. I even sent it to someone else to try to edit it, but it was just not, it, it just wasn't salvageable. The At the time of the recording, the hurricane was actually happening. And while Jen didn't live in Houston, she she lives, um, she, she still lives in Texas. So she was still getting a lot of rain and the sound quality was just poor. So, so I was really, really, really grateful that she agreed to sit down and have another conversation with me and it was fun like we laughed so much in fact this this episode has no structure because like when we got on we just started talking and and then just uh kept going so so it really is just a a conversation so I, I don't ask any of my fun juicy questions on this episode it's just too expansive women talking about expansive shit. We laugh at ourselves a lot, which is important. <laughs> we we definitely poke fun at ourselves and, and the women that we've grown into. Uh, and we talk about really important stuff too. So, so yeah, I enjoyed this conversation very much and I know that you're going to enjoy listening to it. And so I'm going to let you uh, listen in, but I'm going to encourage you, um, stay tuned because I'm going to be making uh, a big announcement in, in a couple of, uh, maybe next week, uh, if I, if I do things right. <laughs> um, so, so definitely listen in because I'm going to be inviting you into the community that I talked about a couple of episodes ago. It is coming to fruition and I will be sharing it with you soon. So in the meantime, listen to this conversation, the juiciest conversation on the internet, because I said so. (laughs) I feel very much like someone that I would have kind of, you know, made a jokey or sarcastic comment about a few years ago. <laughs> right? You you know, it's funny how, you know, like I was, I saw some woman yet the other day in Costco and I thought, oh, I hope I don't become the one of those ladies. Like, <laughs> you know, like she just, I was like, do you have to like, like, do you have to wear like your, your hairstyle? Yes. You get stuck in a certain decade kind of thing. And I was like, yep. but, but so many of the things that I talk shit about as a younger woman, oh, I, yeah. I am now. Oh yeah, totally. I remember being, you know, kind of like very snarky about things like, um, oh, I don't know, like maybe even like dyeing my hair or like Botox or anything. And, you know, just being like, oh my God, that's so tacky. I'm just going to age gracefully, you know? <laughs> and then my face fell apart and I was like, oh, <laughs> I get this now. <laughs> it's it's interesting space. It is interesting space. It is. Um just the the way that you inhabit your body is just so you just have no concept cuz you don't really right. inhabit your body right. when you're younger. You just you just be. You know like there's no right. real inhabiting, but like the older you get and the more you become more of yourself, but mm-hmm. becoming more of yourself brings a whole different awareness. 
It does. And it's so funny too, because when I think about the things that I used to just like not understand when I was younger about like my mom and my grandma and, you know, for example, anytime you're ever leaving to go anywhere with them, they're like, oh, hang on. I'm just going to run to the bathroom like mm-hmm, before we go. Mm-hmm. And I was always like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> what is this about? Now I know. You yep. Know? <laughs> yep. You know, it's funny that you say that because I am so, I, I love peeing. It's one of my favorite things. But I have I have such an awareness of my bladder, like I'm recognizing that my pelvic floor is not as strong as it used to be. But, you know, whereas my tendency before was to like start kegeling to death, like Mm -hmm. I got to get this shit strong. Right. But like now I'm recognizing that what what my pelvis is really asking me for is to fucking relax. Oh, that's interesting. And not to like try to, you know, tighten tighten up, but in the relaxing. So I'm trying to be like really mindful. Like when I do go pee, instead of like trying to push it out, I'm Uh now in the space of just allowing it. Just allowing. Oh, that's interesting. Well, and it's funny because I I go back and forth on the whole Kegel thing. I got to be honest, because there are times that like, I feel like it, I, like it's not, if if that's not something that kind of like naturally occurs, if that's something that we have to sort of work that hard for, then maybe that's not the way that it's meant to be. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that we can get in such, because we have a tendency to numb out and tighten to begin with, mm-hmm. that I think that sometimes we actually can overwork the muscle. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I, the only time I enjoy Kegels is if a dick is inside. Like, <laughs> Exactly. Well, okay, no, I have to say, so I was doing, I don't know if you've done this before. I was doing the weights for a while. I I haven't. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I've done, I've done yoni eggs, but I haven't done like the weight. Yeah, probably really similar. And I mean, but even with that, it's like, there's a point where, you know, you're kind of doing it at first. You're like, oh, this is interesting. Like this makes me really aware of, you know, kind of different things. And, um, But for me, you know, and I know supposedly there are people that just leave them in like all the time practically. But like for me, after, you know, not even an hour or so, like I would just hit a point where I'm like, nope, this has got to come out right now. (laughs) Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a good Kegel in the middle of sex is great. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think, you know, stopping your urine flow every now and again is, is all right. Sure. Um, but I think that I, I think that we might be overworking them in in the in the name of thinking that we're building muscle, you know? Yeah. And I think it, and sometimes I think that that almost creates like more stress yep. there and it, more. It, it actually creates a lot of tension in the in in the tissue and the in, in the vulva inside the vagina. And I yeah. think we, we have a lot of tension there to begin with because we store so much misery there. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Like Uh, that's where we like to deposit. Oh, you know what? This, this kind of hurts. I'm just going to now exile it to the pussy, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like we do it all the time. (laughs) That's where we disconnect, where we cut off and all that. And so, so there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of natural tension that already exists there. But I think that, you know, as women, we struggle with allowing in general, Yeah, I think so too. And I also am very, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the concept of doing Kegel exercises was invented by a man. Oh, of course. (laughs) And it feels like a very male approach to things. It's it's a very (laughs) masculine thing. I mean, but when you think about just the functionality of of the vagina and the uterus, Mm -hmm. like even for like birth, you know, birth doesn't happen from us trying to force or tighten. It comes from uh, from our opening. And it comes from like, even when you are at the point of say pushing, it's a very instinctive. Yes. Cause it's not that you, once, once the water breaks and, and the baby starts to move, you can't not push. No. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I almost think like everything in that area should come from more of a natural. And, and I guess that that's sort of my resistance to the idea of, yeah. you know, constantly kegeling. It's like, I feel like what happens there should come from a natural instinct of doing what feels right. And yeah. Yeah. The, the, the allowing, um, it feels delicious. It uh-huh. feels delicious to just not, not even push P, you know what I mean? Like, right. You don't need to, like once you have to go, when you sit down, 
Uh-huh. All you have to really do is is relax. It'll come exactly. out. Like, yeah. You don't have to like push it. Well, out. and I have to say, like, I, I'm not a pee pusher. Um, That's good. I was a pee I'm the person that runs around for 20 minutes, like having to go, but being busy with other things. Uh, and I, I've winnowed that down to 20 minutes. When my kids were little, there were days when like my husband would come home and, you know, cause we were like swapping off shifts and stuff. Like he did certain days and I did certain days and, you know, and he would, you know, come in at like three in the afternoon and I'd be like, oh my God, I haven't peed all day. <laughs> I, I, I can relate. I can definitely relate. Like now I love peeing. It is one of my favorite sensations. Like when I sit down, I'm like, oh, like it's such a relief. Yes. That I'm yeah. like, this is almost orgasmic. It feels so good to let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really well. But I've also in the last year, I've been very cognizant of all of the all of the resistance around receiving and allowing that I have. And so I've, I've been in the space of really being very conscious of, of receiving and just allowing flow instead of trying to make things happen. Yeah. That, and that's a big one, right? Like that's a big, yeah. you know, a big thing to wrap your head around, I think, because, you know, I think women are taught to be giving like we're, you know, this idea of, of constantly giving and kind of, you know, giving of yourself and giving of your time and kind of being the wind, you know, beneath somebody else's wings and like all this kind of shit. Um, and I feel like it, we get to a point where it almost feels, I don't want to say wrong, but like something about receiving feels off when Mm -hmm. you're used to constantly thinking about giving and pushing and doing and kind of, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I've, I've definitely struggled I've I've struggled with the receiving piece and I didn't even know how much I was struggling with it until until I had like severe money issues in my business. Mm-hmm. Then it was just like, wait a minute. <laughs> like when <laughs> when nothing, when I couldn't even squeeze blood out of a fucking turnip, then it was just like, okay, um, I have to change or shift something because it was yeah. it was so obvious to me. And so it's it's been um it's been a journey. <laughs> I've never loved myself more than I love myself in this space, which which causes me to engage with other people in a different Mm -hmm. way. I've never had this level of awareness of my body and the messaging and thing about being in your 40s. Oh, my God. It's the most amazing thing ever. It really is. Yeah. I am loving this space so fucking much. Yeah. It's there's something like amazingly freeing about it. It's the most, I've never been more of myself in my life. I wouldn't, when I hear people talk about being young, I'm like, fuck that. Like, (laughs) (laughs) no thanks. I am happy to be this age. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm also aware of gravity. You know, I'm very aware Uh of gravity. Oh yeah. And I'm like everything, like the, the sensitivity to things like, you know, I started having hot flashes last year and even like I noticed like my vagina is more sensitive to to the environment than it used mm-hmm. to be that I'm like, yeah, um, I have to be really mindful about everything. Like, you know, I can tell when I'm not drinking enough water. Like I just said that to my daughter this morning. I said, you know, I know I'm not drinking enough water. Not because I'm cotton mouth, which was the only symptom I would have recognized a decade ago. Right. Like, I'm just parched all the time. But it's not that. Like, I noticed the, the difference in smell of body chemistry. Mm-hmm. That I'm like, okay, my body is like, guess what? Keep, keep being dehydrated to see what happens. <laughs> so it's it's, just, it's um, like the early warning light yep, in your car. You yep, know? that's exactly what it's like. That because I I have a very mild body chemistry. So like I'm one of those people that even when I'm like, oh my god, I need a bath. Everyone else is like, what are you talking about? Well, when I'm dehydrated, let me tell you, these armpits. When I, <laughs> I and I never had, I never even, I never ever smelled my own armpits until like two years ago. <laughs> But like when I'm not drinking enough water, it's so like it's and again, nobody else is aware, but I'm like, yep, this is yeah. not normal. Well, and, you know, when you're really in touch with your own body, like those are the things that you are able to kind of parse out on your own. Right. I think we're constantly so overloaded with, you know, health information, which can be useful if it's taken as, you know, sort of 
information um, and not kind of an edict of the only way to do things, you know, because I think that when you're really in touch with your own body, you know, what's up, you know, what's going on, you know what you need. And it just, you know, I think, but there's so much social pressure to kind of do, you know, things a certain way. And I think we especially get that, you know, like in the whole weight loss dieting culture. Oh my God. Yes. Um, is like just this constant, you know, you're supposed to be this way. You're supposed to do these things. And you know what? There's no one size fits all. No, there isn't. All of our bodies are unique in their own way and need what they need. Yep. And, you know, I think that as women, you know, like you said earlier, like, you know, women aren't in their bodies when they're 20. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Like, I think some of that comes from the fact that, you know, women's bodies are objectified from such a young age that you don't feel that ownership. Yeah. Because you get the message from about the time that you hit puberty that your body belongs to the world. You know, whether it's, you know, telling you to dress a certain way or not dress a certain way or, you know, stay a virgin or slut shaming or, you know, eat this, don't eat that, exercise this way, whatever it might be. I think that 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 society trying to control women's bodies is one of the things that makes young women check out of their bodies entirely. Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, I had a conversation with a woman um, last year. I Oh, my friend was having a um, some gathering, so I didn't know this woman, and we were just talking, and and I don't remember how we started talking about like her relationship with her mom, and then she told me this story. She said that just like the day before, she was on her way to work, and there was like the street was blocked off, and so she had to do a detour, and she had to drive a way that she normally wouldn't drive, and she drove by this like this restaurant, like a a chicken restaurant or something, and she ended up having this really visceral experience and she got sick. And what she remembered was she remembered going to that place as a child with her mom. She's an early teen, maybe 13. And her mother telling her she needed to stay in the car because she attracted too much attention. And that was when she started putting on weight to, to cover herself, to mask herself, because that comment made her feel like it wasn't safe to be in her body. Yeah. And it created a, this contentious relationship with her mother and she struggled with her weight ever since. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I just think about how many messages about body and weight that little girls receive even before the age of 10. Oh, yeah. You know, just constantly kind of hammered into your brain. And of course, that's going to have an effect. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it's interesting because like I, I did not know. I didn't know that that people had negative conversations with themselves until I was in my 20s. And I was I want to say I, I must have been maybe 23 or 24. And one of my girlfriends had just had been diagnosed with diabetes. And I joined Weight Watchers with her to, as a support. And and I don't have a skinny pass. So it's not that I couldn't stand to lose weight, but I don't <laughs> have I have no I have no idea what it feels like or looks like to be thin because I've never had that. So um, I joined with her and I remember being at a meeting and, you know, they do the celebrations at first and it's like, uh -huh. oh, five, five pounds or five, whatever. And everyone's cheering. And I remember this woman like getting one of her little stars. I forget how much weight she had lost, but she was getting a star and she stood up like to, you know, because they say like, share your experience or blah, 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 or whatever. And the woman stood up to share her experience and she started talking about like being disgusted when she looked in the mirror. And I could not believe it. I was like, what the fuck? Who talks to them? What, why would she say that? Because even though I've never been thin, I have never, ever looked in the mirror and been disgusted with myself. I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I was so floored that I was like, oh, my God. And I've got to say, like, I think that makes you quite the exception. You I know. know. I didn't I mean, know it... then. But... <laughs> Because, you know, you think that your experience is the rule, you know? Right, like, right. I, I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. Like now I like. I, well, and I wrote something about that the other day, like about how, you know, for women, like it, the message that we get from our culture all the time is that hating your body is the norm. Right. Hey, you know, like that kind of sense of, of self-disgust and hating your body and wanting to change it is the norm. That should just be our expectation. Like what a crock of shit. 
You know, because a lot of the things that we want to change, we can't. And the, consequently. Exactly. Well, exactly. Like, you know, the, the quote ideal is actually achievable by such a small percentage of the population that it's a ridiculous concept. Yes. Well, you know, um, my, my guest last week, she was saying, we have these little pictures. Like, like, and that's true. Like, we have these little pictures that that's what we, whatever they put in the magazine, that's where we're measuring ourselves. Yep. And, exactly. and now plastic surgery has created mm-hmm. this idea that even if you don't have that body type, you can have it. Because now, you know, everyone had the, has these ginormous asses and these small waists and these big giant mm-hmm. boobs. And again, there are a couple of people, and there might just be two, that, you know, that actually look like that. And the rest of the, the, rest of the scale is swinging in the other direction with aspiring mm-hmm. and doing it by any means necessary. To create well, I mean, what's that really, you know, like this image that hardly anybody can naturally, you know, kind of achieve. And then it's something that maybe some people can kind of pay for. Well, what's that if not kind of like wealth signaling and class signaling and whatever else, you know? Absolutely. And it's unfortunate because the messaging, even, even the self-love idea, that's mm-hmm. a great concept, but what we really need is self acceptance. <laughs> like, fuck love. Mm-hmm. You can't, because most, exactly. most people will never ever get to the place of them actually loving themselves. But right. acceptance, you, if you can just get to a place where on any given day, in any given moment, you can just accept that this is how things are right now. It doesn't mean that you can't yeah. want to lose a few pounds. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to, like, you know, go binge eat something. You know, or, or, or the opposite of that, right? Like, but in this moment, this is, this is how I look today. And I, and, and I'm okay right now, even if you have goals outside of that. Yeah, I think that's, and I mean, that's the first step toward anything, mm-hmm. right? It's just kind of getting to that place of, okay, it is what it is. But we struggle with the, well, we, we struggle with any, any semblance of duality. Mm hmm. Because it has well, to be Well, and the like other piece this. of that is like when people get to that point of, of self-acceptance, they still have to run the gamut of dealing with other people's expectations mm-hmm. and bullshit kind of all of the time. Yeah. You know, I've been gotten really conscious of over the last, you know, six or eight months, how much of conversations, like just normal day-to-day conversations out in the world with people you know well and people you don't know at all revolve around things like diet and weight loss. And it's kind of wrapped up in this guise of, quote, health, but that's not really what anybody means. No, it's not. Well, but you know, like I think even, even in those, you can gauge how someone feels about themselves by the way they engage in those conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a Korean bathhouse um, last year and, you know, everybody's naked, which I'm very comfortable with nudity. I'm nude right now, actually. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, everyone's naked. But I remember being so aware, like, you know, we had done our all the little rooms and the spa stuff. And so now we're like in the shower because we're getting ready to get dressed and go home. And I remember being in the shower and like looking around because you can see everybody. And Mm -hmm. I remember looking at this woman and she had this very like strong musculature. Like she was, she was too tall to be a little person, but like the way her body was, was structured, she had the strength of, you know, like these really strong legs and these really strong arms. And so I remember thinking like, wow, look how strong her legs are. Or look at, you know, look at, look at her arms. Like, like she looked like, she looked like um, she could have worked out a lot, but you could tell she didn't, that that was just how she was made. Right. And next to her, though, in contrast, was this much older woman, clearly in her 70s. And, you know, so her skin's a lot less taut and, you know, things are hanging. And I but I still remember looking at her also and thinking like, wow, like she looks really great for her age, however old she is. Like, you know, and mm-hmm. like, like, look how full her breasts still are. And you know what I mean? Like I had this awareness and then I realized I wasn't saying I wasn't talking shit. Like, I, you know, I wasn't thinking, oh, my yeah. God, I can't believe like she need to cover up. You know, like I wasn't saying anything like that. <laughs> But I recognized that the reason I wasn't was because my self-love tank was high. And that as long as I am full, 
I have, there is a less likely chance that I'm going to judge someone else because my judgment is a direct reflection of how I'm feeling about me and not how I'm feeling about someone else. Which explains so much about how judgmental we are as a culture, right? Because I think that most people are walking around, you know, feeling that sense of being like less than, being not enough, being, you know, kind of not measuring up or whatever. Yep. So if if I'm not feeling enough for me, then I'm either going to look at you like you're too much or you're not enough either. One Mm -hmm. or the other. Yeah. I can't be in acceptance of you if I can't be in acceptance of me. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, like part of part of um, even liking yourself, even if you can't get to love, like just liking yourself, Mm -hmm. even so much of that is based on how you see other people in relationship to themselves. If you are surrounded by, you know, women or men that don't really like themselves, then all that's been modeled for you is that. So you think that's normal. Picking yourself apart. Everyone does it, you know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I can even see, you know, like looking back to growing up, um, you know, I, I had a lot of weight stuff for a long time, but not, and not until I was an older adult. Um, you know, I was actually pretty thin when I was younger and, but growing up with my mom who, you know, was never really overweight, but just thought she was Mm -hmm. constantly always on a diet, like always kind of, you know, and it was like everything from like Weight Watchers to, you know, Atkins to whatever, you know, she was basically obsessed with her weight for my entire child still is in fact. And, and it's kind of funny because she's never actually been overweight. Yeah. Um, perception is everything. Yeah. Yeah. Perception is everything. And then two, I know I, I wasn't affirmed enough as a child. Like I wasn't like that. Just that wasn't how my family worked. There were no, you can do anything. There was no, right. you're yeah, so no, beautiful. That, you know, like we what? didn't really have much of that either. Yeah. Like what, <laughs> what is that? Like, but I, and I don't know, I didn't come here to learn that because I've always been really self-assured. In fact, I'm, and I was always chubby. So it's not like I didn't get teased. I did. And my response to that was, I did not understand what they saw because I didn't see that. So when when kids would like call me fat or tease me, uh huh, I eventually over time I developed a perception of my size because I was told that, not because I felt that. Not because you perceived it yourself. Exactly. So like, well, and it's funny because I kind of had the same thing because from the time I was about, oh, I don't know, 12. And I mean, I, w- I was a 12 year old that looked seven. I was like this little scrawny thing. Um, But it was right about that age about, you know, and I when I was still probably underweight um, puberty that my mom started to get very worried that I was going to get fat. Mm. And everything, you know, that I ate or everything, you know, like she just started kind of constantly voicing this concern to me over and over and over again, where by the time I was in high school, even though, you know, and I mean, I was like a size four, like whatever, I had started to perceive myself as being fat, as being overweight, as needing to lose weight, because I had just like heard that concern kind of so many times. Yeah, And it's not, you know, and you, you get it from sort of everywhere at that age, you know, every magazine is telling you how to lose weight, every, you know, that kind of thing. But I remember feeling overweight for a long time before I ever actually gained any weight. Yeah. Our society and this, this idea of, of an ideal, which is malarkey. (laughs) (laughs) Just that crazy. Right. But it's, it's fucked us all up really bad. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because now I'll look back at pictures of me, like when I was that age and I'm like, oh my God, what was that? Because in, because the way that, that I look then is in no way close to the way that I perceived myself. Then. Yeah. 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 I, you know, and I think that there are a lot of, a lot of people, you know, particularly women, I honestly, I have, I've had very few experiences with men who pick themselves apart in that way. You know, their measurement is, is you not around weight. It's a, it's a yeah. round penis size. Yes. Like yeah. that's such a thing. Um, mm-hmm. I had a conversation recently with one of my <laughs> friends and he was saying that 
he gets, you know, because women are objectified for, again, like their entire lives, mm-hmm. you know, now he's, you know, of the age where he's like, now he gets an, a little bit of a snippet of what that must feel like, because now women are always saying they want men that are, you know, endowed or they want a man that's got this many inches. <laughs> and if that's not what you have, like, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's where well, it's, it's interesting too, because it does make sense that it would sort of take longer yep. to, to come up with those ideas because, you know, in most cases for most men, they're not really seeing like a whole huge selection of other, I would assume of other penises right? Well, to be able to like compare them. Exa- we wear ours on the outside because the, what people are judging us by is the outer appearance. Where exactly. You're yeah. Not walking down the street, looking at dicks all day. And in the shower, of course, they, you know, this masculine fragility doesn't even allow them to directly look. Or at the urinal or exactly. like whatever. Yeah. Like you can't look down at somebody else's But, you know, it is really interview. funny because if you actually have a conversation with, you know, men about, you know, sort of where they fit into the lay of the land, if you will, like, you know, the kind of averages and that kind of thing. One of the things I find really interesting is that most men don't have a clue. No, they don't. And there is a lot of this kind of like insecurity, like the, the am I normal piece? Even, even the ones on the bigger end. Yeah. Oh yeah. All of them. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. They don't even know if they, they don't know if it's big or not. They still are thinking it's not big enough. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because, because of the, and then porn doesn't help because some of what they are right. measuring up right. against is. You know, of course, in porn is not exactly within the law of averages. Exactly, <laughs> it's like that's almost a prerequisite. Like you know, for the to yeah. even get in, get get an audition, or if if they audition, mm-hmm. I don't know how it goes. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I imagine they must audition. But now I'm curious, Stacy. Now right. I feel like do, I need do, to find do, out. Right. Do you audition like a regular script for a porn role, or I guess it seems like you would. <laughs> Because of the acting talent that's required? Right? I don't know. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I yeah, I never thought about it, I guess. Maybe. I never did either. But, like, <laughs> it really it gets me wondering what are the – I, I want to know how the job description's like, written up. Like, how do they <laughs> – Where do you even apply for porn jobs? Is there, like, a monster dot porn? You know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I may have to do some research on this and get back to you. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And who has the job of writing up role descriptions for porn? And are there actual scripts? I doubt it. Maybe. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Oh, my God. I never thought about it before. I didn't either. But now I'm a little curious. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine. I don't know where you would apply for such a job, but. Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but if that's the only way you can measure the length of your own penis, most, most men would think that they're on the smaller end of the spectrum. Oh yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. that's definitely the option that I have, you know, that, but they're not really necessarily going to say that out loud either. No, no. Um, yeah. Cause even the, the men that I've known that I have had a few men like say, you know, but it's almost like they're fishing. Because it's not, they're like trying to yeah. say that they're small, but really they want you to tell them whether they are or not. Yeah. Well, and there's like, there's a certain attitude that goes along with it too. You oh know? yeah. Well, you can tell like, well, even if oh, a man yeah. doesn't know, even if he doesn't know where he falls on the scale, you can tell the way he feels about his penis without ever seeing it. Yes, for sure. Well, and I find that, that for the ones that are genuinely not well endowed. Um, there's kind of, it's like the Chihuahua effect. Yep. The overcompensation. Yep. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to project big, (laughs) even if I'm not. Yep. But you know, and usually that projecting big is, is so hollow, you know, it's kind of so, it's just like over the top where on the other hand, when you have say a great Dane, like that's a, that's a pretty calm. (laughs) they're, They're not yapping all the time. He's, nope. <laughs> he's not, he's not even, he's unfazed. Exactly. He is, he's not threatened by anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's <laughs> well, and, and look for any man that is listening, <laughs> most, <laughs> most women really don't care that much. 
No, I mean, it's not a... It's not even the main factor. No, it's really. not. Because I have I have been with men that were on the larger scale that just didn't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. Or felt like they didn't have to do yep. anything because well, that was supposed to be enough. Yep. That's yeah. that's very true. But you know, the same speaks to the same speaks to um level of attractiveness because even a man with a big dick, if he doesn't feel like he is physically attractive, mm-hmm. he he then tends to have more skills around sex and yeah. men that even if they're on the smaller end of the scale if he if he has been told that he is physically attractive then he probably doesn't know he hasn't even tried to be good in bed and he probably doesn't know that he has a small dick either probably not because everyone's told him he's so fucking cute yeah but yeah. you know the same now i have heard men Complain. But if there are men listening to this skills are fucking everything everything I'm just everything Everything, like even just to know know your way around a vulva is important. No shit, yes. Like know how to touch one. Like <laughs> somebody should be giving classes in this. Yes, know how to touch one, and please, please do not treat the the clit like a nipple. Yes, you cannot treat a clit like a nipple. No, you can't suck it like a nipple. It's, it's not, not a nipple. same thing. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Seriously, though, like somebody should be giving classes on this. Well, I am really good ab- about being very vocal with the men that I do know about such things because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I've been known to g- give pretty detailed yeah, instructions like, myself. <laughs> right. Get it together. Get it to fucking gather. And please, like if you if your goal is to get her aroused, please don't even start with her clitoris. No, God, no. You do better starting with the nipples, believe it or not. Like, mm-hmm. but again, like that's not what they see. Anymore. Or with anything else. Anything else. Like her yeah. whole body is a sex yep. organ and you should probably save the best for last. In fact, if you avoid, if you avoid touching anything in the pelvis region. and absolutely, If you avoid it for as long as possible, she will be so aroused that she will fucking rip your clothes off. Exactly. <laughs> but nobody tells them. No. And, and, and what. And why doesn't anybody tell I'm like, like, that's kind of what I, you know, I've got a 17 year old son, right? Okay. I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything. I, I already, you know feel like I'm reading between the lines and I don't fucking want to know. Okay. So not me, but somebody. (laughs) Well, why not you? (laughs) Because it's just too awkward. Like, I mean, you know, I've said enough, I've heard enough. I've, you know, like whatever, but I'm just thinking like, like, wouldn't it be great if somebody could be having a conversation with young men about these things, you know, and, and about the whole package, like not only what is enthusiastic consent look like, but what do you do after you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, because I I, I know for most of us, like sex with younger men when we were much younger was really a mixed bag. Most, mostly mostly not great. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, I think that it's twofold for one. Female pleasure is omitted from any sex conversation. Period. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. Not, it's, it's not on the menu. No one talks about it. You know, we come, we, it, and, and speaking from- Heaven forbid we threaten the purity of our young women. Exactly. Like, but like from an American perspective, our take on sex is abstinence. We talk about contraception and prophylactic. So it's either, mm-hmm. either you're abstaining, but if you're not, don't knock her up and don't catch nothing. That That's the extent of the conversation. Yeah. But I think that well, not only is that the extent of like the instructional conversation, but if you look at the way that sex is portrayed in movies, on TV, and like all of these different ways, the things that get women off on screen are fucking laughable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At best. <laughs> yeah, at best. They are a man's idea of what gets a woman off. A yeah. man who frankly probably doesn't know how. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but I think that that's exactly why. And and I I don't have a son, but I've got nephews. But I think that that's that's why women we have to get comfortable having the conversation because if mm-hmm. you just leave it to his father, he's going to only talk, tell him about the mechanics because that's how their minds function. Right. Right. So like the women, like because because even a man that's good in bed can't really tell you about a woman's pleasure. He just knows where to put his hands. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But a woman can talk, yeah, speak, that's true. speak directly to, you know, to, you know, a mechanic can fix a car. That doesn't mean he could build one. So like, the, I think like as women, we have to talk, to, we have to speak to pleasure. So like my older nephew is 26 and mm-hmm. I was very vocal. Um, thankfully, my older sister um, was very um, generous in latitude <laughs> with me about such things. Um, but I was very vocal with, and, and with my daughter also, like, you know, I had like the oral sex conversation with my daughter when she was in like n- at ninth or 10th grade. I remember mm-hmm. her riding in the car with some of her friends and me ear hustling, right? They're talking about oral yeah. sex. And I said, wait a minute. I said, let me tell you something. When I said, when you guys are having these conversations, when, when boys and are talking about oral sex, they are only talking about getting their dicks up. Yeah. Oral sex in, in high school is usually has nothing to do with cunnilingus. We talk in fellatio only. And I told them like, I'm sorry, you do not need to even get started. Don't you suck a dick if there's no reciprocity in the conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, like I'm like, I'm, your pleasure is important. And I, t- I spoke with my daughter about the perception and her, her own pleasure and about that being important from the beginning. And I don't know yeah. why I didn't, cause I wasn't where I'm at now, but I did, I knew that I didn't want her to be, I didn't want her to grow up to be the kind of woman that did not enjoy sex. Mm-hmm. So I didn't ever give her the scare tactic talk. And same thing with my nephew. Like I talked, we talked about condoms, you know? Um, I, I happen to, I won't tell his business about the, his size, but I'll just say he needs magnums. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but because of that, I was very mindful about, even with that, you got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Like You can't just be diving in and plunging because, you know, pussies are delicate. Like you got to be mindful of her comfort and her level of what's okay Because that's a concern when you're on that end of the scale. Whereas it's not just on porn, everybody's pounding every fucking thing. That doesn't feel good. Right. And well, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if that's the only kind of introduction that, and I think it is for a lot of boys that they're getting, and girls are most likely getting even less than that because they're probably less likely to be watching as much porn. Right. Right. Well, so it, this- when you said that your pleasure is important, I just like in my head, I had a flash of a book cover with your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is important, you know, because the part, the what's happening for women. So boys, their idea of, of sex and relationships is porn, whereas girls, our idea is rom-coms. So you see why we're speaking yes. two different languages, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We're thinking that every sexual experience is supposed to be love, hearts, and horseshoes. And yep. guys are thinking it's orgasm is the is the goal. I need to feel like the man when I'm finished. So right. these are two very different... And girls are thinking my only goal in life needs to be to land the guy and then happily ever after, right. it's over. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's, but that's the reason, like we, we, we have to change the narrative on both sides. We have to make, we have to tell our daughters that their pleasure is important. We have to tell our sons, her pleasure is important too. Your, yeah. your pleasure is almost a given. Like, you know, you got to really. Yeah, it's a different thing. Completely. Like you are, you, you have to do something really bad to fuck up an orgasm for a dude. Really. Mm-hmm. Like it has to be. I read something the other day and I can't remember where it was. And it was basically talking about how men and women rate sex being good or not. And for men, bad sex is, oh, it was just kind of like so-so. It was kind of boring. And for women, in a lot of cases, good sex is, I wasn't in pain. Yes. Yes. Well, That's two different universes completely. Well, well, because a woman doesn't even know that pleasure is part of the thing. In fact, I have several girlfriends that are around this age, so they're in their Mm -hmm. 40s, who still don't know if they've ever had an orgasm. Oh, my fucking God. And I'm like, by yourself, too? Wow. How is that? Well, wow. if no one ever tells you and and if running in the background of your mind is I don't want to be a slut. And, yeah. and if the conversation is always, well, I don't sleep around. And my response to that is always the same. Well, it's OK if you do. Yeah, it's OK if you sleep around. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with sleeping around. Take care of you. But if that's the narrative, if the narrative is I don't want to be a slut, I don't want to be perceived as a hoe. 
Of course you're not having pleasure. You're too busy stuck in, in self-consciousness. Right. Well, because we do the same thing with to women with sex as we do with food, absolutely. right? Absolutely. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's the ex- and and the relationship that we have to sex is often the same relationship we have with food. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to overindulge. Oh, I really yep. like sweets, but I can't eat too much. You know what I mean? So, yeah. oh, I really like sex, but I can't, I can't, I can't like it too much. Right. So it's, it's definitely. Um, I can't like it too much. Yep. I can't stray outside the plain vanilla ice cream. Right. I can't. <laughs> but you know, it's a, there's a lot, there's more than 31 flavors. Uh huh. <laughs> you can have it however you like. <laughs> You can have it however you like. Not to mention the toppings. I mean, Jesus. Absolutely. (laughs) Look, cookies or not, you know, like there's a lot of things you can do. (laughs) Fat-free, sorbet, don't have dairy. You don't have to have dairy. There doesn't even have to be (laughs) coming or milking doesn't even have to be part of the thing. Exactly. It can be completely non-dairy. And if pleasure becomes, if, if sex becomes about pleasure instead of about the prize of her orgasm or at least the one she fakes, right? Because mm-hmm. because a lot of men, their their idea of sex is chasing her orgasm. And so the woman performs because if she doesn't, he's going to keep doing this jackrabbit sex that doesn't feel good. So exactly. oh, let me hurry up and pretend, <laughs> you know, but but we have or to- if she doesn't, then she has to manage, you know, his hurt feelings on right. top of it. You know, it's not you. It's me. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but I think that the conversation the shift in conversation around sex is the same as all of these other conversations, these really important conversations that are being had. They have to come from women. And as much yeah. as we don't want to bear the emotional labor that comes with telling a man how to be better in bed, the reason that we have to is is one simple reason. And that's because there is not a person on the planet, no matter what gender they identify with or, or, I, or genders they don't identify with, there is not a human being on the planet that did not come through a pussy. Mm-hmm. That's, that's why it's our responsibility. Yeah. It is, it is absolutely our responsibility because we have been complicit in the mediocrity of the way that they approach sex. Yeah, that's very true. And I think, and beyond that, like women have stopped valuing pleasure for its own sake. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my goodness. You know, it's like, it's been beaten out of so many women and, you know, we need to reclaim that first and foremost. Absolutely. And it really is like, does this feel good? Mm -hmm. And, and let me show you how to make me feel good. And knowing how I like to be pleased is not slutty. And so what if it is like, (laughs) it's a shit, right? Like, I mean, you know, really. And again, like we have to, we have to explore our own bodies if we even want to even be able to have the conversation with someone else and don't feel shy about it. Like, can you move your finger Mm -hmm. like this? Like, I have no problem if a man is finished and I'm not finished. I'm like, you got 10 fucking fingers. Get busy. I'm not done. <laughs> like you can be done and I'm not, yeah. I'm not mad. Uh-huh. I don't, I don't have any, if it's fast, I don't give a fuck. Cause I'm not judging you. If it was only, if you're right. so excited, it was two minutes. Great. I'm still not finished. Let me, let's, we, we got some other stuff we can do. It mm-hmm. doesn't, sex doesn't have to be penetration. Exactly. I mean, there's so many different, yeah. There's so much to do. So, There's so much on much, the menu. So much. <laughs> but again, like what we've been taught is it's it's penetration is sex. Yeah. Yep. Well, and the whole, I mean, I, I think you're dead on with like the perception of, of, you know, what makes you slutty. And I think maybe that line is different for every woman. Instead, I feel like the question that we should be asking is, why is that the worst thing you can be? Right. Well, I, I have no problem. Call me whatever. Same. Yeah. Look, look, call me whatever. <laughs> but what I am going to do is be pleased. <laughs> <laughs> look, with or without a part, <laughs> my, my yeah. pleasure is absolutely on the menu as often as I possibly can. That, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm like, you know, I have about like I have no interest in getting really old. So I would like maximum for me is like 80. So I got about 35 years left. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even want to be beyond that, but about 35 good years left. And I really want to be fucking for as long as I possibly can. I Absolutely. W- I mean, I want to ride it until the wheels fucking fall off. 
I am so unapologetic about how much uh, sex is one of my favorite things about being human. I really like it, you know, but I also really love, like I had a great cup of coffee today and mm-hmm. I really love cucumbers and Kalamata olives together. You know, like I like, the, yeah. I like the way it feels when the sun kisses my cheeks. I like when the ocean laps at my toes. Like there are lots of things that, that all of them are really sensual experiences and sex is just but one expression of this visceral experience that I'm here to have. Like, I want to feel good. I want my skin to feel good. Mm -hmm. Well, and these are all just, you know, that's all back to the being in your body thing again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, like to do your own work, whatever that looks like, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever protections and safety mechanisms you have erected to keep in the effort to keep yourself safe. If you can start unlocking that shit, everything changes. I mean, yeah. I was not having, I, I, I've i always been orgasmic, but I wasn't present for most of them for, mm-hmm. for a long ass time. It's a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I have as well. Like I've, I've in some ways like had a hard time, like kind of wrapping my head around what you said about people our age that haven't. That's, I mean, that, that was, that is, you know, and I know that that's true because I've heard of, you know, that being the case with a lot of women, but it is, it's more complicated. I think there's so much emotional baggage kind of tied into yep, that. A lot. Yeah. A lot. You know, and, and again, when you don't have any understanding of your body, again, not just because they don't teach you any pleasure is not part of the conversation in biology or anatomy or physiology. I took all of them and I never mm-hmm. remember hearing anything. That word was not part of the dialect. No. Never. No, and I almost feel like that's deliberate because, you know, it, it's this kind of effort, especially when you're talking about, you know, high schoolers and junior high schoolers and what have you, like to, because God forbid you encourage, you know, them to explore their sexuality. Like, I think there's that piece of it, that it's a, mm-hmm. it's a conscious thing to keep pleasure out of it. But, you know, in Denmark, I heard, <laughs> I heard that <laughs> in, in Denmark, they actually include female pleasure in the conversation. Which is like fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. And guess what? They don't have a high rate of pregnancy. Imagine that. So I, it, it definitely, we can't leave it up to the schools though. Like we have to mm-hmm. initiate, like we have to normalize yeah. it. You know, um, my people get a kick out of me because my, my daughter's now 22. But like mm-hmm. I had like, if she goes a long stretch, like I'm happy to say, you know what? You need to get some. <laughs> That's what you need to do. You know, like, because if I knew that she wasn't eating lunch every day, I would say, you know, you're starving at dinner time because you're skipping lunch, you know? Yeah. Like, I would say that. So we have to stop acting like it's not a very real part of the human experience. Everybody's fucking doing it and everybody's pretending like they're not doing it. Yeah. I, well, and I feel like it's the the feeling of things being like taboo or secretive or all of that. I mean, that's what causes all of this shit, yep. right? Like we've got all of this like shit that's come out over the last year, which, you know, of course has been going on forever. And of course, you know, there's all these people that are so surprised about all of this. And I'm like, really? Look, how could you be? Yeah. But you know, there are and and I'm not defending men, but a lot of this, the reason it's so rampant and it's because now it's like, is there a guy who hasn't committed some mm-hmm. kind of harassment or assault? And I think the reason is it was normal. Yeah, it was fucking normal. What do you mean? Everybody is doing it. Everyone is talking about it. You know, I mean, just the experiences I've had in my own personal life, you know, with with saying to someone, please stop shoving your hand down my pants. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like in my own personal life. Yeah. That was normal to that person. So me saying something is like, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like, well, and I think, you know, you go through different, like different industries and companies and that kind of thing. And there's a, there are a lot of things like that, that have been completely normalized within those particular institutions. Exactly. You know, I I was a woman in the military in the early nineties. And I can tell you that sexual harassment was completely normalized into the institution. I can imagine. And I can't even the, uh, the level in a, in a very, very masculine driven industry like that. Oh yeah. I can imagine. Every single day. I mean, it's, you know, just to the point where, I mean, the other thing that also happens is like, as part of that is there's a certain level of like desensitization, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so you almost get to a point where you're not even noticing or acknowledging it. Wow. And I think that that happens 
in a lot of industries, like it, when things become the norm. And I think the way that things become the norm is partly this kind of, you know, secretive sort of two faced, you know, we're going to say one thing and do another, Yep. which is absolutely the message that we give kids about sex all the all time, all the time, all the time. Like, don't you do it, but I'm going to just, I'll, I'll be back. You know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, pretend you're not doing it. And yet, you know, no, because we all live in the world that it goes on all the time. Exactly. But don't tell me about it. You know, don't don't acknowledge it. Don't you know? Yeah, we yeah, we I, I think the culture is shifting, albeit slowly. We can't handle too mm-hmm. much at one time because we are slow to evolve. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I think that the culture is changing. I also think that before it gets better, it's going to be overly sensitive like it is right now. Yeah. I mean, like now you have to be so careful, like about everything. And but it's because we were so careless about everything. And it's interesting, too, like if you think about how this whole like kind of sexual harassment, um, whatever you want to call it, like coming out sort of thing like this happened in the 90s, too. Yep. And somehow, you know, so I think whatever came up then didn't really get resolved. It just sort of went back underground. Well, I think, too, the 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 loudspeaker was not that loud. You mm-hmm. know, like now the Internet is like having a boom box. Well, like and not only the ear. loudspeaker was not that loud, but if you look at, you know, probably the biggest um, example of all of that in the 90s was Anita Hill. Like yes. She's in Clarence yeah. Thomas. yeah. And the fact that she, you know, was basically royally fucked over, I think sent a message, sent exactly the wrong message, you know, in a lot of ways. Well, I think I think that there was a couple of pieces to that. Like not only was she a woman, but both parties were black and that made a difference. If that mm-hmm. had been if that had been two white people, they would have been a completely different experience. Mm-hmm. Because even now while all of everyone's talking, p- women of color are not really really represented in this conversation. Right. Right. And so I think that that because that would have been a very different outcome. Even if she, I'm not saying she wouldn't have been still thrown under the bus as a woman. She would have been. Like that is for Mm -hmm. sure. That is for sure. But the conversation would have been completely different if she if if both of them had been white or even if and she would have been thrown under the bus even more had she been black and had he been white. Yes. Yes. So like there's that's such a layered um and she still hasn't gotten, you know, I mean, you know, she's, oh, she's no. got an I HBO mean, movie. Yay. I mean, when you think about even like the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky thing, I mean, mm-hmm. she still got the shortest end of the stick around that. But had she had she been a black woman, we may have never even heard anything about that. Well, and I mean, she also came out over and over and over again and said it was consensual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, I think. You know, the other piece of it is like, too, like you're saying with women of color aren't really being represented in this now. It, you know, I think that just makes it that much harder to come out, right? Like every sort of intersection of another identity means that it's going to be that much steeper of a battle, Mm -hmm. right? Like, Mm -hmm. so it's no wonder that, you know, in many ways, a lot of the people that have come out now are people of, you know, pretty privileged existences, you know? Because the the even just in women in general who are not of a particular socioeconomic background, whether mm-hmm. they are colored or not, are are right. not part of this conversation. Like when you think right. about the well, women, because it's a hell of a risk to take. Absolutely, when you think if about you don't all the have women, the protection of kind of the public eye and the public adoration yep. and and whatever else, right? Because what could it mean that you won't you be on the street tomorrow? Mm-hmm. You know, when you exactly. think of how many women are in massage parlors it being expected to give happy endings mm-hmm. or, you know, yeah. how many how many women are cleaning hotel rooms and getting groped because the guy, you know, is in the room still or, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. like that, you know, that happens yeah. probably on a fairly regular basis. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and how many women are, you know, wanting to come forward about something and just not willing to go through the fact that everything in their life is going to be picked apart in the public eye? Absolutely. I mean, because and, and not just by men, by women is too. fair game. By women yeah. too. I've heard so many women and, a, and several older women say, mm-hmm. well, why would she, why would she not say nothing all these years? And I'm like, seriously? Are like, you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Like, what planet did you just come from? 
Yeah. Of course, like for one, because she already knows that regardless of whatever, whatever the circumstances were, she's going to be perceived as blamed. Mm -hmm. It's all like she shouldn't have dressed like that. Yeah. Or she shouldn't have whatever. She shouldn't have even been there with him. She shouldn't have been there by herself. Like, you know, like, what? Yeah. like, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe he should have been able to control himself. How about that for an idea? Yeah. What kind of underwear was she wearing? Right. You know, how how many guys had she been with before that? Like, you know. Well, and, and that speaks to that slut shaming thing again, you know, like mm-hmm. that, like however many people I have, however many notches in my bedpost is of no consequence of whether or not I said no to you. Right. Like that's irrelevant. But every single time a woman has come forward, that's what it becomes. I mean, that was the that's what happened to the the woman with the Kobe Bryant situation all those years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, well, she it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she fucked five minutes before she got in the room. Yeah, it does not matter. But that's but that's the narrative. That's the, so. So, of course, women have been quiet. And, and in Hollywood culture, that was it was normalized. Yeah, for a long time. It yeah. was normalized. Well, and I mean, you even look at the, I mean, I don't know if you, well, you probably remember this because we're about the same age, but when I was in, I don't remember if it was like high school or just after, but the whole, you know, William Kennedy Smith case, yep. right? Yep. Like it all hinged on what kind of fucking underwear she was wearing. Yep. Like that was, you know, that was the case and that was okay because she was wearing Victoria's Secret underwear. So obviously she was asking to be raped, you know? It, it's crazy. It's crazy. And consent is a conversation that never ends. And that includes right. when you are fucking married. Because can we? Yeah. nobody's talking about the women that are raped by their husbands on a regular mm-hmm. fucking basis. Yeah. Like that's a real thing that just because she said I do does not mean that you have unlimited consent to her body anytime you feel like it. Exactly. But that's the thing. So there's, it's so layered. It's so layered. I'm really grateful that the conversations are being had. And again, I do, I definitely think that this is just another area that we, that we have to take the reins with, with our sons. Cause a, a man can say, you know, if she says no, don't do anything. But a woman can say, here's what happens if you did. Right. Well, and, you know, so I've been having conversations around also, you know, the fact is for younger girls, teenage girls, you know, often the motivations are different. Um, You know, there's a difference between adolescent girls and adolescent boys. And for girls, I think in a lot of cases, the motivation for something like that is more about seeking approval. Yep. And, you know, all of these kind of things. And that that's a different thing. And I think it's important for, you know, both people to be going into things with with a similar motivation. But what we have to be having the conversations because the narrative, you know, the romantic narrative starts before the porn narrative. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you Prince Charming, he's coming to save me. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. he, he hasn't even seen anybody whacking off on film yet. But her, yep. she's been watching the Disney fucking princess yes. since before yes. she had language. Mm-hmm. So, of course, when he says he likes her, of course, yeah. he's coming to save me. <laughs> You know, so we we have to those conversations have to start so early. Yeah. But if we normalize it first, first of all, one of the things that we have to do as parents and I'm so grateful to not have young kids anymore. So anybody who is listening that does have young kids, God bless you for real. (laughs) But I'm grateful that I'm beyond that. But I think one of the things as parents that we have to do before we can have conversations about sex, we have to stop sexualizing every fucking thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like breasts are not sexual. Right. Mm-hmm. Like that's not, you know, that that's a non-sexual conversation. We have to normalize like your your vagina, it's its only job is not just sex. But if that's the yeah. only time we're talking about our reproductive organs, if that's the only narrative there is is sex, then we don't even know non-sexual touch. There's no conversation about that. Like Yeah. Well, know? and that's especially important for for boys and yep. men too. Oh, for sure. Because, you know, from like a certain age, it, you know, the only kind of touch that boys kind of 
get in a lot of cases is either, you know, the the violent or kind of semi-violent or sex. Yep. That's it. You know, so we need to normalize that as well. And it's interesting that when you look at cultures where men have more of a or less of a taboo around touching, they tend to be less violent. Oh, yeah. Well, because, again, first of all, a lot of them are suffering from touch deprivation. Right. Um, When they get to a certain age, nobody's touching them. Mm-hmm. They get fist bumps, you know, in the locker room or yeah. or the, the, the occasional shoulder tap, you know. Yeah. Their mom stopped hugging them because now they smell like puppies. <laughs> right. Like, that's the thing. Like, mm, you stink. You need to go. You know, I will shower. say like the, the stink goes away after junior high school. They they become huggable again. <laughs> it, it does. But like through through the through the stink phase, nobody wants to touch you. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, please. Like everything smells like a sweat sock. Right. So nobody's yeah. nobody's touching you. And then your father's not touching you because that's not masculine. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, so, so then anytime a girl gives you eye contact or brushes your shoulder, she wants me. Uh, no, it was just crowded in the hallway. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's very true. And it, you know, and it becomes like this, this where exactly what you're saying, every touch is is sexualized. Every touch is sexualized, but, but we, and that's something that I didn't really, you know, hadn't really heard a whole lot about until recently, but I, you know, it's in retrospect, like made me grateful that we're very touchy around here. Well, it's it's so important. And but, you know, like, again, like nobody really differentiates the difference between physical intimacy and sexual intimacy. They're not the same. Mm -hmm. thing. No, they're not. They're not the same thing. Like you can have extreme physical intimacy with someone and not have any sexual chemistry whatsoever. Exactly. Same sex or opposite sex. It doesn't even matter. Like, and so like the, when you think about like, when you see the kids that like when I was a kid, we, when we were in teens, you know, late teens, like this was the Yo MTV rap era, right? Back, back when mm-hmm. kids actually <laughs> like came in the house to watch particular shows. Yep. Like we would all like pile into one of my friends, like um in her den. And it was probably like 10 or 12 of us. And most of us were, most of them were guys. There was only like a few girls and we would like lay all up on each other. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. Yeah, it wasn't, exactly. it wasn't a thing. Like it was, there was no, like that's gay, you know, and not that there's anything wrong with being gay, but back in the, back in then, right, you know, right. we're talking late eighties. <laughs> like That was a thing, but we didn't have any, there was no language around that. There was it wasn't a big deal. Right. It was just a, yeah. And I remember like very similar age, you know, one friend had one tiny Toyota pickup truck and there were 14 of us that liked to get around in it. Um. Yep. And <laughs> back when seatbelt laws were different, you could pile in the bed. Yep. <laughs> There'd be six of us in the front. And, you know. Yep. And it wasn't a big deal, but like. Nope. And you stacked according to size because that was fair. Yep. You know? Completely. And it wasn't a big deal if you had to sit on someone's lap. Yep. But like we we have to we have to desexualize first Mm -hmm. and then normalize. Yeah. And it's tricky because it's a fine line between, you know, looking at things like, you know, asking people's permission to touch them and also developing this this physical intimacy. You know, it's it's tricky stuff. But I feel like it's even more important now that so much of the communication and all of that has gone online. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, if, if it's because it's not going to shift with our generation, right? It has to right. start. It's kind of like, you know, back in the day, and and this is a, a reference to um or- Dan Brown's origin's latest novel. It's a great book, by the way. Um, touches on it when there's a section in the book where he's talking about um, where Robert Langdon, the character, is talking about how God changed over the over the course of time. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas back, you know, we had all these Greek gods, and there was like more than one. It was like Poseidon, and you know, the the God of the sky, and the God of the sea, and the God of the this, and the God of the that. You know, Hades, and all these different gods, and then there was like Zeus, right? But you could not have, back in the day, you could not have told someone that Poseidon wasn't real. That was, you know, that was like blasphemous. And incidentally, Poseidon looked a lot like Zeus, if you notice. Like, they look Mm -hmm. very similar. So over time, though, when they discovered that that wasn't a real thing, the people who had always known that could not accept that. But who could? Their children. Yeah. And so... 
this conversation is not going to shift. We can talk about it and we have to initiate it, but the way of operating is not going to be transformed in our generation. We have to do it with the generation that's coming up. So if you have young children and you know, you've got like a toddler where they're now able to commute, even if they don't have language yet, they know yes or no. And you know, when a toddler wants something or when they don't, right? Like even (laughs) if they don't, even if they are not able to verbalize it yet, they are very clear about, they, they will get their point across, right? But if if at that age, you begin to ask them the same way that you would ask, do you want peas? Mm-hmm. If, can I touch you? Is may, yeah. may I hold your hand? If that, if yep. we start giving them full ability to give consent when they're that age, then the consent conversation, whether you are male, female, or unidentified, you, it never is a thing because that's all because you Because it's know. just built in. Exactly. Yeah. So that's how it has to begin because we can change behaviors, but we have to keep reminding ourselves to shift. If we start it with them, there is no reminding. That becomes just a way There's of There's nothing being. to change. It's just the way it grows. Exactly. Yeah. So that's how it has to happen. But we, we, have to, we have to normalize it. We have to normalize non-sexual touch. We have to normalize sexual conversations. We have to make it okay for you to touch your own genitals as long as you aren't, you know, standing on a street corner with your dick out, you know what I mean? (laughs) But if in the, in the comfort of your own home, if you, if it soothes you to wrap your hand around your penis or to stroke your vulva, Mm -hmm. have at it, keep your hands clean. (laughs) Like that was the rule for my daughter. Like, it's okay if you want to touch yourself like that by yourself, make sure Mm -hmm. your hands are, you know, when she got to a certain age, you're going to want somebody else to touch you soon. Make sure his hands are clean too. You know, one thing I didn't want her to have is a vagina that vomits. Like, don't do that. (laughs) Like, right. (laughs) But, but I wanted her to know it was okay. And, and if you want someone to touch you, fine if you want someone to touch you but even in wanting them to touch you you get to say like guess what you got to go wash your hands first Mm -hmm. so that was like completely normal and I'm happy to say she was out of high school before she actually did it so even having a conversation and I started that conversation when she was a toddler well yeah and there's this whole perception that you know if you talk about it they're gonna they're gonna run right out and do it but yeah it's you know it was the same with my kids like it was never it was something that we talked about you Mm -hmm. know it was something that we were like pretty open about and you know same kind of thing it wasn't like I don't think that they were any more you know in a rush or whatever than their peers if anything a little bit the opposite absolutely because it was a more informed decision absolutely (laughs) absolutely like you already know if your body's not on board it's a no yeah regardless of how he looks on paper. Cause you know, sometimes you, I really want to like him, but you don't, but you know, yep. your body <laughs> says no. You, so there's, so you get the selection is different. Like your, your ability to decide based on what you want, as opposed to based on what someone else is asking you for is completely yes. different when, when there is already a conversation, because even if there's a, a, a conflict, even if it's one of those, I want to like him, he's so cute, he's popular, whatever the story yes. is. Yeah, you there's still this. Well, but I don't really I don't feel attracted to him because, you know, Mm -hmm. the difference then. No, it's a visceral response. Yeah, absolutely. But if if no one has ever had a conversation, all somebody has to do is look at you and you think you like them. But really, you just like the fact that they like you, Mm -hmm. which is a very different experience. Yeah. So we've got to open up the dialogue and we have to. And, and you know, even that, though, how do we begin having the conversation by accepting the fact that we ourselves are sexual beings? Yes. And ju- and that that's perfectly fine. That's the way we're supposed to be. Absolutely. Because life is still sexually transmitted, regardless of how technology <laughs> has, you know, like there, there are other yep. options, but s- life is still sexually transmitted. For the most part, even now that in vitro is, is really old now, right? Right. Mo- I don't, I have yet to meet a single person. I don't know one person. No, I take that back. I do. I know four because I have some friends that had um, two sets of twins in vitro. I think that they might be the only ones I know. Most of us, most of us don't know that many people that that's how their life began. Right. Well, and even that you can make the argument that I bet, you know, in some ways their life began by that making an effort first. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Because nobody, well, I'm sure there are exceptions. Most people do not skip right to the Petri dish. Most people try even, you know, even 
even people that are interested in their same sex, a lot of them will still try regular before they go there. So yeah, it's still, it's still very sexually transmitted. And it just is bizarre to me that something that is responsible for life itself is a thing that we try to act like doesn't exist. Yeah, it's nuts. It's just completely crazy. Probably the dumbest thing ever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Probably the dumbest thing ever. Like, this has been so good. I'm so, it's so much fun to talk to you always. The Sensuality Project is produced, edited, and hosted by me. Music by bensound.com. The Sensuality Project podcast is a production of stacyherrera.com.